Amen. Good morning to the body of Christ. Good to see everyone as we celebrate our first Sunday in this, the year 2018. God has seen fit to give us his favor, allow us the privilege of life and health. That's right. And we should not take that for granted. And we should be ever thankful, appreciative, and indebted to him for all of his kindness. I recognize that we are expecting some inclement weather, and we are prayerful for those who are not able to be here. Uh, but they keep pushing the time back. It was supposed to be 10 o'clock this morning. Then they said 1 o'clock. Then they said 2 now they're saying four o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, so maybe they'll just keep pushing till they push mm -hmm. it on out of here. That's right. Uh, but nonetheless, we have assembled to worship our God, and that we shall do. I want to invite you to Isaiah chapter 48, and if you'll meet me at verse number 10, in Isaiah chapter 48, and uh, this is a follow-up to our Wednesday Bible class. If you're not in our Bible classes, you are missing a great time and receiving instruction from our Lord. We talked this Wednesday about uh, having a sense of perspective and how we look at things and how we look at how God works in our lives. And so this is a supplement to our discussion from this past Wednesday, and we'd like to encourage you to come out and to participate in fellowship with the saints. Isaiah chapter 48, uh, if you have verse 10, smile and say amen. amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 48 and verse number 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted when I will not give my glory unto another? The message this morning is entitled, The Right Place and the Right Time. As we look at this particular passage, I want us to understand three objectives in this lesson. As we talk about God loving us, many times we think of God's love in terms of the favorable things that we get or the favorable experiences that we have. And I want us to understand our first objective is that even when God disciplines us, that's a dimension of his love. That love is not always about the things that we like, the things that are favorable, that sometimes God has to love us and express that in a different dimension, which could mean doing things and allowing us to experience things that we don't necessarily like. The second objective is all of us need to believe, especially as we realize we have been blessed to see another year, that God is preparing us to go to the next level in our lives. And in order to experience the blessings on another level, sometimes God has to allow you to experience some things on this level that you may not like, that you may not desire, but they're designed to cause you to be prepared for the next level of blessings and favor. The third objective we have in looking at this passage is not only does God show us a dimension of his love, not only does he prepare us to go to the next level, but God will do things to produce his character in each and every one of us. And so I want to suggest to you in our time today that where you are right now, you're in the right place and you're in the right time for God to do what it is God will do. As we look at this again in verse number 10, the Bible talks about God being a refiner and that he allows us to go into the furnace of affliction. When you look in the Bible and it talks about the love of God, we don't like to talk about being in the furnace of affliction. We don't like to talk about being refined. We 
we will brag and boast about the goodness of God when we get bigger things, more things, and better things. But we don't brag about God loving us when he's whooping us or when he's allowing us to be in the furnace of affliction. When, when we get a promotion on our job, we brag God is good. When we get a raise, God is good. We get a new house, God is good. We get a new car, God is good. We find a new relationship, God is is good, but when we're in the furnace of affliction, sometimes we forget that the same God who blessed us in those favorable times is the same God who's good in the furnace of affliction. I want you to notice some things uh, very carefully in this text. Number one, that God will put you in a place. Number two, God will put you in a predicament. And number three, God will put you in a place and in a predicament for his purpose. Let's look first of all that God will put you in a place. Again in verse number 10 he says, Behold I have refined thee but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace. That sounds like a place. He will put you in a place. When we talk about God putting you in a place, a place can be a physical place but more often than not where God puts you is not necessarily a physical place. God will put you in a disposition, in a state of mind. He'll put you in a situation. When we talk about a place, it's not necessarily geographical, but God will put you in a state of mind, a situation, a disposition. In this sense, in verse number 10, we understand that when God leads you somewhere, he not only leads you to desirable places, Sometimes God leads you to undesirable places. For example, when we look in the Bible, we can easily say that God led Abraham and God led Moses and God led the children of Israel because when we look at where God led them, it was a favorable experience. In faith, God led Abraham to Canaan's land. In faith, God led Israel to the promised land. He led Moses to the promised land. He didn't get to enter it, but God led him at least to be able to see it. And so whenever we talk about something favorable, we can always say God led someone to something that felt good, looked good, some favorable experience. But in verse number 10, God is still leading, but he says, I've led you to a place, and the place I've led you to is a Furnace. It's one thing for God to lead you to Canaan. It's one thing for God to lead you to the promised land. But God, that same God says, I'll lead you to the furnace. Well, why did God lead them to the furnace? Well, one of the things you have to understand about Israel is that God sent them prophets. And there were prophets like Jeremiah, for example, who were sent to warn the people with a word from the Lord. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. So God allowed them to go into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And so when he says this furnace of affliction in Isaiah 48 and verse number 10, the Bible said God led them into this Babylonian captivity. When we look in the Bible, the, the furnace is a place that God will put you in because in the furnace of affliction, there is a blessing. And sometimes before God can make you, he has to break you. So sometimes God has to break you all the way down so that he can build you all the way up. If you don't believe me, ask Joseph. You remember Joseph was kind of arrogant, and Joseph thought a lot of himself. You, you have to be careful not only having a dream, but you got to be careful who you share your dreams with. The Bible tells us Joseph told his brothers, I had a dream that y'all bowed down and served me. You, you got to be careful telling somebody you see them in that kind of light. And, and Joseph's father played favors. Joseph's father gave him a coat. And Joseph's father seemed to have preferred him amongst his other sons. And so God wanted to use Joseph. You know the ending of Joseph's life, how that Joseph was in a position to bless the people and how Joseph was able to provide food in the midst of a famine. But before God could exalt Joseph, he had to allow Joseph to be broken down. In Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 24, Joseph's brothers put him in a pit. 
If you look in the Bible in Genesis chapter 39 and verse number 20, you discover that Joseph's master's wife lied on him and he ended up in prison. Now, think about Joseph. Here it is. He's arrogant. He's cocky. He thinks he's all of that. He thinks somebody owes him something. He thinks other people are to bow down to him. And so before God could put him in the palace, God had to allow him to go to the pit and allow him to go to the prison so that he could be prepared for the palace. Mm -hmm. And so when God leads us to the furnace of affliction, it's because God puts you in a place because you're out of place and you can't be prepared for the place until he gets you out of your place so that you can learn what your place is. So when God allows you to go into the furnace of affliction, the same God who will lead you to Canaan, the same God who will lead you to the promised land is the same God who will allow you to go into captivity. It's the same God who will allow you to go to the pits. the same God who will allow you to go to the prison because God has to break us down to build us up. All right. Amen. Amen. But not only will God put you in a place, God will put you in a predicament. Somebody can say amen. amen. All right. All right. Notice he didn't just say in the furnace. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah 48 and verse 10. But he says, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Mm -hmm. now, now when we're afflicted, we always say the devil's picking on us. Yes, but, but verse number 10 says God chose us mm -hmm. right. Right. to be in the furnace mm -hmm. of affliction. Mm -hmm. Well, turn over to Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, I want you to see a word in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 25. This is not our everyday vocabulary, but I want you to see a word that will bless you if you ever find yourself in the furnace of affliction. All right. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 25, yes. the Bible says, and I will turn my hand upon thee. Now, now it, it's one thing when God's hand is for you, but when God's hand is turned on you, that's something else. But he says, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. Can, can we look at the word dross? Let, let me help you understand why we're in the furnace of affliction. When a metal is put into the furnace, in order for the metal to shine, the refiner has to stick the metal in the furnace to get away the dross. Dross, those are the impurities in the metal. And the furnace burns the impurities so that the metal can shine. It can't shine with the impurities inside. Y'all with me? Sometimes you're trying to shine for the Lord. But you can't be on fire for God till you've been in fire from God. And when we go to the furnace of affliction, God is trying to get the dross out of us. He, he's saying, I need to burden you. I need to afflict you. I, I need you to suffer because I'm trying to get something out of you that's keeping you from shining. Now, now, if you've ever been in the furnace of affliction, the furnace doesn't feel good. All right. And so if you don't like the furnace, you, you better make sure God gets what he wants to get out of you the first time so that you don't have to go back in there the second time. Let me ask you to think about this in Isaiah 48 and verse number 10. I want you to notice something. In verse number 10, the Bible says, Behold, I refine thee. God manifests himself as a refiner. Well, what does a refiner do? There are two things to remember about a refiner is when the refiner is trying to get a completed, perfected 
outcome from the furnace, there's two things the refiner has to do. Number one, the, the, the refiner has to know how hot for the furnace to be. Number two, the length of time for the object to be in the furnace. God knows how much pressure to put on us. Amen. He knows how, what degree that we need to burn. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look in Isaiah 48, verse number 10, it says, but not with silver. Many scholars are conflicted on what's meant by this phrase, but not with silver. And one of the prevailing thoughts, and I would share this thought, is that silver and gold need a different degree of burning in order to accomplish the purpose. Have to burn sil silver at a much higher temperature than you do gold. You, you have to have a much stronger heat for silver. So it could be that what the Lord is saying is that when he says not with silver, is the Lord is saying, I know how hot to make it, but I ain't going to kill you. I, I, I can treat you like gold. You don't have to burn as much as silver. I, I don't have to go to that degree, but I still will put you in the furnace of affliction because I know how much heat you need in your life. And I know how much time you need to be in the heat. Well, Brother Gibbs, how do you know this? You're preaching from the Old Testament in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 2. The Bible says that after that you have suffered a while. Yes. See, God knows that we suffer, but he allows us to suffer for a while because he's trying to get an outcome. Well, what is the outcome? Well, when you look at putting something in the furnace, number one, it mentions the idea of removing the dross. We talked about that from Isaiah 1, verse number 25. But let me help you understand another reason why God will put you in the furnace of affliction. If you go out to Wentzville or to any car plant, anywhere where they have to melt steel. You see those 18 wheelers that have those big sheets of steel. Mm -hmm. You see them going down the expressway and they're taking them to plants. Yeah. And when you get to GM or any plant, uh, I had the privilege once of going to the John Deere plant and seeing tractors made from one end of the plant to the next. And because I, I don't have a professional background and working in the plant. It just fascinated me. <laughs> but, but one of the things that you discover at GM and John Deere, wherever you go, is that when the truckers drop off those sheets of steel, those sheets of steel have no value to the plant unless they can be molded or shaped. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so sometimes they use stamping machines, sometimes they use the furnace, uh, but they put it in a position where they can change the shape of the steel. Mm. If, if the steel won't cooperate, GM can't use the steel. Mm -hmm. So GM has to put it in the furnace or put it in the stamping machine so that they can change the shape. And so with God refining us, the reason God puts us in a furnace is because we out of shape. And so God has to put us in a position where he can mold us. And so he has to heat us up in the furnace of affliction to say, I'm trying to mold you. I'm, I'm trying to make you a Christian. I'm trying to make you holy. I'm trying to make you pure. I'm trying to make you a saint. But you need to be molded. And so you can't be molded if stuff is always fine and you always have fair weather in your life. You can't be molded if stuff is always well. If you don't never have an enemy, if you don't never have a struggle, if you don't never have a strain, if you don't never have a problem, a heartache, or a headache, God can't use you. But it's when you're in the furnace of affliction that God can mold you and shape you, and you come out of the furnace better than when you were in. Thank the Lord. Think about at least three people in the Bible. How God had to mold them in the furnace of affliction. Think about number one, Moses. If you really study Moses' life, you, you see Moses spent 40 years in Pharaoh's house. 
He had a life of privilege, good-looking man. Moses had a lot of stuff going for him. He even killed the man and thought nothing of it. And it wasn't until God broke Moses down and put him in a position where Moses had to realize, I'm not as strong as I thought I was, and I ain't as special as I thought I was. And it wasn't until God broke him all the way down that God could use Moses. You remember Jacob? We talked about Jacob in Sunday school this morning and how that Jacob was a deceiver. And Jacob, even with his mama, Rebecca, they planned and plotted and deceived the daddy to give the birthright to Jacob that rightfully belonged to Esau. Jacob was even born in some kind of way, symbolically suggesting something about his personality. Because remember, Esau comes out of the womb first, but Jacob is grabbing hold of Esau's heel as he's coming on the womb. There's something about Jacob. Jacob is a deceiver, and Jacob is some that when his daddy said, what is your name? Then Jacob said, my name is Esau. And God had to wrestle with Jacob. And then God said, what's your name? He said, Jacob. <laughs> See, the last time you was asked what your name is, you lied and said Esau. But when you come out of that furnace of affliction and you have to wrestle with an angel of God, then when you ask your name, you said, my name Jacob. <laughs> Think about Paul, how that he was on the Damascus road, having persecuted the church, preparing to persecute the church more. And, and God had to do something interesting with, with Paul. He blinded his eyes. And what's interesting is that God had to blind him to make him see. Because it was not until God blinded him that he asked, who are you, Lord? And he says, it's me, Lord. You, you, you're, it's hard, Paul, for you to solve because you're kicking against the pricks. It's, it's interesting that God had to blind a man to make him see. So God not only puts us in a place, he puts us in predicaments because it's in the predicament that we learn to be perfected. And then third, last, what we see is that God puts you in a place, he puts you in a predicament, and God will put you in a place in a predicament for his purpose. Notice in Isaiah chapter 48, in verse 10, God says, I'll put you in the furnace of affliction. But then in verse number 11, he says, for I do it for my own sake. Even for mouths. He said it twice. It's like, y'all yeah, remember, we, we, don't, we don't say stuff to our kids like, the older generation used to say to their kids, we need to write down some of them sayings Big Mama in them had. Because, see, that may be why some of our kids are messed up today. They ain't getting some of that old school teaching. Remember Big Mama used to say, you don't believe fat meat is meat. And as a kid, you have no idea. What do you mean fat meat is meat? But they say something to you. And then you act like they ain't said nothing, and they got to make a believer out of you. And so they say, you don't believe fat meat is greasy. And you, you feared hearing that because that usually meant they were about to go upside your head because you don't believe fat meat is greasy. So what we see here in verse number 11, God says to Israel, y'all don't believe fat meat is greasy. So let me tell you why I'm doing this, but I'm going to say it a second time in case you missed it the first time. He says in verse number 11, I put you in the furnace of affliction, notice in verse 11, for my own sake. But y'all don't believe that meat is greasy, so he says it again. Even for my own sake, I will do it. Even for my own sake will I do it, for how should my name be polluted and I will not give my glory unto another? God says, I put you in the furnace of affliction for my sake. Well, why is it for his sake if I'm suffering? Because it's for our good. Right. All right. I, I want to remind you, Revelations chapter 3 and verse 19, and then I want you to turn to John chapter 9 and the message will be yours. But I want to give you some, some fun homework to do. You, you'll, you'll enjoy this because it won't take you but five minutes. But I'm not going to tell you until the end of the actual end of the message because y'all going to start looking on the internet as soon as I tell you. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. I want you to see something in verse 19 and then I want you to turn to John chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 19. 
That's the last book of the Bible. All right, all right. Come on now. All right. Revelation 3, 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Let's go back to old school parenting. Remember when parents said, I'm doing this because I love you. It's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. One day you're going to thank me. And we said, I ain't going to deal with that. But we had sense enough not to say it out loud. God says, because I love you, because I love you, I rebuke you and chasten you. That's what Isaiah 48 is saying. God says, I put you in a, in a place and I put you in a predicament because I love Thank you. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Now, I, I, want, I want to tell you about a, and this is a true story. This is not a preacher's tale. This is a true story. And I'm going to give you a website if you want to go read about this. There is uh, an Australian guy by the name of Nick Buddha Chiku, and I, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm going to spell the name for you. It's B-U-J-I-C-I-C. -I -I -C. Now, let me give you his website. It is lifewithoutlimbs.org. Lifewithoutlimbs, L-I-M-B-S. Let me, let me tell you his story, and it'll, we'll close with John 9 and 3. He was born without arms and legs, and he experienced depression because he was born without arms and legs. And if I remember correctly, I think he may even have thought about suicide, but at minimum, he, he dealt with depression. And his father was a preacher. And his parents could not wonder, could not understand in all of their wonder, why would God allow their child to be born without arms and legs? Right, right. And when stuff happens to us, what do we say? I'm a good person. Why did this happen to me? There's other people this could have happened to. And somewhere around the age of 15, he read John chapter 9, verse 3. And it changed his life. Mm. And now he's a motivational speaker. And again, you can go to this website, lifewithoutlimbs.org. And here's what he read. And it, let me give you the synopsis of what he read. Remember in John chapter 9, there was a man who was born blind. And the question was raised, who did sin? Because in Bible times, they believe if you had physical illness, it was always the result of sin. That's what they believe. Notice in John chapter 9, this, this is what changed Nick's life. In verse 1, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, now, let's look at how ridiculous their question is. It's ridiculous, number one, because they want to know, did he sin that he was born blind? That suggests he had to have sinned in the womb mm -hmm. to be born blind. That, that doesn't make sense. Now, notice the question. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? When could he have sinned? In the womb. The second ridiculous part of the statement is that if the parents sin, they're assuming that the son is bearing the punishment of what his parents did. And here's what Nick says changed his life. It's verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither have this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're looking for the cause, and we need to be looking for the purpose. Okay. You cannot always explain 
why stuff happens. Amen. Amen. And I am guilty. I'll raise both my hands and twinkle my toes. Mm-hmm. I am as guilty as anyone to say that when life happens, there is this endless nagging search to explain what happened, why it happened. And and I've discovered two things. Number one, you can't always get the answers you're looking for. And I've discovered number two, if you had the answer, you can't undo it. It ain't going to change. I mean, even if we had the answers we want, it's not going to undo what has happened. And really three things, because you can also add to that some things you looking for answers for, you don't want to know as much as you think you want. It's some stuff that we ask about why and we question and we try to analyze and we try to figure out. But I've come to discover in life there are some things, even if you have the answers to, some answers will blow your mind. And some things it's just better that we stop trying to figure out the cause. And that's what was happening here in John chapter 9. They're trying to figure out what caused this problem. And Jesus says, don't look at the cause, look at the purpose. And the purpose is that in what happened, God wants to manifest himself. Look at the last part of verse 3, that God should be made manifest in him. The purpose that God has is more important as to why stuff happens. And we have to learn in our lives to stop trying to figure out why and just say, Lord, help me to see you in whatever has happened, whatever I've experienced. Help me to see you like I've never seen you before. And when you get to see God, that's all the things that you need to understand. You don't always need to understand why. Ask why when you get to heaven. Well, everybody else sitting around looking at the gold and the pearls and talking to Elijah and Moses you can be in heaven asking God, well, why this, why that? But right now, just focus on seeing God when you're in the furnace of affliction. You're in the right place and in the right time. God allows us to go to the furnace. He'll put us in the right place. He'll put us in the right predicament. And he'll do that because he has a purpose, which is to manifest himself. I told you there are three objectives in our message today. Number one, God wants to show us a dimension of his love. Number two, he's preparing us for the next level in our spirituality. And number three, he's trying to produce his character. Amen. Amen. As we close the message today, I want you to remember these words. I want you to go to the website, lifewithoutlimbs, it's a .org. It's a very inspiring story, and uh, you will be blessed if you take just about five minutes to uh, look at the story there. And one of the things that you'll see in that story is that we complain about everything until you look at somebody else's story. Can you imagine, man, our, any arms or any legs, and we complain about every little thing in our life, and it'll make you say, thank God that things are as well as they are. That being said, as we close the message for this day, we hope, trust, and pray that you have learned something, you have been reminded of something that will benefit you spiritually. If you'd like to respond by <clears throat> requesting the prayers of the church or just giving praise to the greatness of God, you may do so as we stand and say.